Welcome to Building Bellingham. I'm your host, Leo Cohen. Season two is starting off a little different than season one. We're not in the studio and our conversations are live streamed onto the Building Bellingham Facebook page before they make their way here. We're a little rougher around the edges, but the core is the same. Honest conversations with local entrepreneurs talking about challenges, failures, and the effort it takes to build a successful business. Join me as we dive into the story behind one of Bellingham's biggest brands. Eric and Bree, the Greens. Welcome to Building Bellingham, uh, episode four here. So we're on season two. Thanks for joining me today. Um, Are you guys at the home office or at Greenhouse today? Where are you guys? We're at Eric's home office. Very cool. Very. I can tell that uh, that it has been decked out with Greenhouse uh, beautiful decor there. Um, in the background. I'm not going to let him, like, he needs me to give a little bit of touch of just, you know. It's got to feel good, you know. It's got to feel good. It's got to feel right. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time, and I know, Bree, we've we jumped on the Pivot series together, but I've been, mm-hmm. I've been excited to have both of you on this because you, you guys are high-octane humans. You guys are operating at a really high level, and I'm fascinated with you guys and how you do that and how you balance so much in your life and support each other. And uh, so we'll we'll jump into all that. But before we get going, um, tell us a little bit more about, for those that are watching, um, about Greenhouse um, and a little bit about your backgrounds before you got into that, uh, taking over that business. Totally. Um, I think it was probably, gosh, it was a few years of like Eric pushing just like Eric had been in real estate for well back down like 15 years in Whatcom County. Um, I was pretty high up on the food chain for Hagen and um, I was definitely still growing at Hagen but just kind of felt like something was missing. He was constantly pushing me to just do my own thing, um, throwing me various businesses that were posted for sale whatnot and um, I was still just kind of lost as to what that meant and what I wanted it to mean. Um, So I ended up getting early 2017, mid 2017, got my uh, real estate license. Uh, Wasn't sure if we wanted to do that together as a team. He was still pushing me to find something else. Um, And it was a uh, just vendor meeting I had regularly at Hagen that all of a sudden it was a mutual vendor between myself and the former owner um, of Greenhouse, Chris Foss came in and sat down and was like, oh, I'm so bummed. Um, I just had my last meeting with Chris and I was like, what, what are you talking about? Why? He's like, well, she's retiring and closing the doors. And I'm like, why would she do that? And he's like, well, she, you know, they're having a retirement sale. She never did find the right buyer. And uh, you know, that's, she's just determined to do that. And I'm like, she's not gonna do that. And like, he's like continuing to talk the vendor and I'm literally turning to my computer and typing Eric an email saying, um, I, I, we're buying the greenhouse. I know exactly what I want to do. We're buying it right now. Like quick call them. Like they're already putting the the store, you know, closing. So, so I mean, fixtures are going to go like you got it right now. And he responds back. He's like, cool, cool. That sounds great. Listen, let's talk about this at lunch. And mind you, it was like 11 o'clock. Like it was an 11 o'clock meeting. And I'm like lunch. No. And again, the vendor's still like trying to communicate with me. And I'm just like over here doing my own thing. And um, so of course I pulled up the greenhouse, uh, Facebook page, sent them a message and said, um, I know you intend to, to close, you don't want to close. I'm going to buy it. And Eric, <laughs> as always, he's like, I couldn't wait for lunch. Don't ever tell me to wait. And somebody immediately responded. was like, thank you for your interest. However, you know, we have determined that we are going to close. And I said, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I don't think you actually want to do that. Uh, I'd like to put my real estate agent in touch with your real estate agent and uh, get a conversation going. And um, not disclosing that Eric was my real estate agent, but, um, and I again got in touch, uh, it was actually Heather Baker, reached out to Heather and said, I'd like to buy Greenhouse. And she said no. And I think it was like three more times of them saying no. And then they realized that I was serious. I was gonna, I wanted to buy it. And it was like all on the same day. And um, this was a couple days before Thanksgiving. 
So perfect yeah, timing, reviewed- right? Just like any other entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah, totally. It always right? comes at the perfect time, right? Perfect time. And then <laughs> it was like a couple days before Thanksgiving because we reviewed the financials on Thanksgiving. Big packet of stuff. On <laughs> Big packet of stuff. Went to uh, the store to walk through it on that Friday, the next day, Black Friday. Um, sat down with Chris and Foss on, um, it was either Sunday or Monday. I don't think it was a Sunday meeting. It was super like, and then the rest is history. So, and this is, so let's, let's go back to that, that moment of diving into the due diligence of a, a, a business that's been around since 1972. Is that right? And so, yeah. mm-hmm. so you're, you get this huge stack of, of paperwork, of financials. What does that look like from a due diligence standpoint? I've never purchased a business myself. What does that look like to review somebody else's finances versus doing things the way that you're used to doing them and knowing what it's going to be like next year and the year after that? Um, tell me a little bit about that experience. What was the due diligence like to purchase a, a business? <laughs> it was a lot, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially for me. You know, uh, yeah. retail's not my forte. It's not my thing. I've been in real estate way too long, and <laughs> it's that's that's what I know, right? So. Um, buying a business, uh, yeah, especially retail business. I, I didn't know what I was getting into, of course, and just kind of, uh, it's been a learning process and I'm still learning a lot. So, um, Brie with her, uh, her background, um, you know, she, she has an accounting degree. She knows a lot of, she's a numbers person. She knows how to, how to look at, uh, P and L sheets and, and just everything and diagnose it. And, um, that was not only that, but we had, uh, we had her dad, who is also, uh, he was a CFO of Hagen for many, many years. And he's, a uh, he's, he's, you know, what <laughs> brought Brie up to, to be the same type of person. So he's very, um, conservative though. I'd say he hasn't yeah. taken any risks in his life. And he looked at the financials over Thanksgiving dinner and was like, I mean, you know, this looks like you could do this. Like, it doesn't look like you're out of the, you know, you're not crazy was basically what I was just asking to do. Yeah. Like, look at these numbers and tell me I'm not crazy. Um, and I mean, definitely what I saw was this room for growth and, um, you know, the previous owner, Chris, I mean, she's an incredible human, but she herself admitted just like, uh, due to just personal things that happened in her life, she kind of left it, the business for five years in terms of just like being able to, to continually grow it. So I, I definitely saw this huge opportunity. Um, I knew it wouldn't be instant gratification. Um, I knew it'd be a process, which it has been, but I mean, it's, there's so much I've learned that I could educate people on now with, you know, looking at papers and just the things to ask for and the things not to ask for. I mean, it, it, there's so many little things. I mean, you can't take anybody's word for it. I mean, when they say they just upgraded their computer software, computer software now, I mean, when you hear that word, it, it should have been probably in the last year or it's already, you know, out of date. Right. And little things like that, you know, we heard things and because of the short timeline, we kind of took them to their word, not to say that they weren't the right word it would just you know definitely there's just little things like that that i know now um but it's just a process it's right a process yeah and you know being we were fairly new at it you know and this is our first this was our first go at it of, of stepping out and um getting involved in a in a, in a pretty big pretty big operation really for for us even though it's a small business you know you're still taking on right off the gate i think we we got in with, uh, you know, 19 employees. Yeah. Some, some had been there for, you know, almost 20 years. Yeah, like, so, they've been like, a long time. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to get through there. And, um, managing a, a large team to start off like that, where most of them know, know more than what you're, <laughs> what you're doing. Um, you know, it, what was that like to, I mean, because you've, you've built your, your real estate business, and you were used to how you operated at Hagen, Bree. So what mm-hmm. was that like to step into a business and have the humility to understand that people that were already there knew more about the business, but you knew you had this vision. So you had this vision mm-hmm. of what you wanted to do with it, but stepping into it saying, I am starting kind of fresh here. And tell me about that experience. How, how is that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because it ended up being more fresh than uh, what I intended it to be. You know, I virtually purchased this empty shell of a store. By the time, there were just certain agreements that I had to get signed and in place, and it was such a short time period, and it was also the holidays. So, I mean, 
all the items are going out the door as quickly as they can. You know, they're selling floor models for furniture. And so when I bought the store, um, the back kitchen area was this, I called it a bowling alley. It was just, it was empty. We had everything in um, the limited inventory we purchased was in this little a small corner of the store that was, everybody knew it as the dinnerware section. And it was crazy. Uh, I felt really good on one sense because I was like, okay, this is a fresh start. But then the other sense I thought, okay, but I need to first get the community's permission, I felt like, to make this change and to show the community my vision. Like to me, it wasn't just my employees and my team. I needed to show the community and get their permission to show them my vision that I had too. So I brought in a lot of the same things that were carried before. Um, a lot of just the good popular items. I threw in a little bit of my sprinkle of personality on it and then um, really dived more heavy into it. Like after that first month, you know, six months probably period of just asking the community and the employees, my team for like the permission to trust me and to trust the vision I had, if that makes sense. It does. What, so tell me a little bit more about, so you've got this, this kind of the routine inventory that clearly people liked because they were coming back, you had repeat customers for that, you know, the yeah. most popular mm -hmm. items. Tell me about the sprinkle that you put on it. What's, what's your style? What did you add to that inventory that was kind of an ease into, hey, this is what another part of this that I want to do? Totally. It was like this limited demographic that we were speaking to. And I was looking at this big picture of this amazing opportunity. Um, like, how do you build the brand to go beyond Bellingham, beyond Whatcom County? Because um, I felt like the concept that I had allowed me to do that. But the current brand that I was given was speaking to just a smaller demographic. So what I brought in was just a variety of things. Um, styles, you know, weren't limited to just kind of a set style that was before, but it was bringing in the styles that they loved and then adding in the style of just a little bit more contemporary, modern, maybe a little bit more um, just bohemian, little younger taste, you know, making sure the millennials felt welcome to come in, making sure the price points were kind of varied with it too, and the price points would carry with it. Um, definitely adding in just small bits of just a, a Scandinavian minimalistic style and feel, which, you know, before everything was, you know, pretty just limited, I guess, in the terms of the style of the um, decor that we had. Yeah. And, and at this time, so you're, you're diving into this and Eric, you're running a real estate business. So you're, mm -hmm. that's what you're focused on. But now, now you're, you're in this, it's kind of a support role. You're like, Brie, what, like, what, what do you need me to do right now? Was that kind of like when she was diving into that, was that what it was like for you? Just what, what do you need me to do to fill in the gaps? Or were you on the, like, what was um, you doing at that time? You know, I just kind of roll. Yeah. I just kind of rolled with it <laughs> um, <laughs> for the most part. I mean, like I said, retail, it wasn't my thing. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, in the first six months, and I've even learned more since. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was total change of pace for us, for sure. Uh, we, we <laughs> I think it was though, wasn't it in that first five months that I did the first staging for you, and then you started seeing? Wasn't it in that first time frame? Probably, yeah, probably. Yeah. So I staged one of his list stains, and I said, "Look what I can do." And it's funny because if I look at those pictures now, I'd be so embarrassed. I'd be like, this is the worst <laughs> staging job I've ever seen anybody do. Like, what am I even looking at? But I'm like, look at this. Like, look at how this business can help benefit your business. And I believe the community wants this too. And uh, that first listening, I mean, I can't tell you how many people asked how the bed frame was. We stole the table and chair set that we showed there at least three or four times, including to the homeowner. I uh, saw the living room set and I'm like, okay, these businesses can work cohesively, you know, together. Yeah, it's that, was, a that was a huge benefit for sure. Um, you know, just just having the, creating that win, win, win situation between the greenhouse, our real estate business, and then also the homeowner. I mean, it was just a win all the way around. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then for buyers, you know, um, the buyers of the house, they, they were thrilled. They wanted to purchase, you know, several items that we had in there just because they look so nice. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was just, it was great for them. We, you know, we, we give everybody a little bit of discount when, uh, when they're purchasing straight from the staging. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's nice too. And it, it makes it nice too, because you are the, the source too. It's not like a third party yeah. source. You're saying, well, actually I know exactly how much inventory of this I have. I can make this happen. Mm -hmm. Here are the things I can do. So it was a big yeah. concierge, a moment of like recognizing that you've just 
leveled up in your concierge service for your, for both businesses. So, so this is 2017. And I actually remember, I think we, we went out and grabbed lunch and it was a while back or his dinner or something along those lines. Yeah. And you yeah. were telling me about that. I, I remember that, that specific listing that you were telling me about. And so 2017, you take this on, um, this is right around the, the holidays. And I had never been in a greenhouse prior to you guys owning it. And so when I went in there, I think I was, when I met, uh, met you both there, I was pretty blown away. I, I thought it was one floor and it's actually, is it three floors? It is. Technically right now the customers are just, we just have inventory on two, but it's three floors. I get my steps in without any issues every day. <laughs> those steps in. Yeah. So there's, yeah. So going from, you know, being, ha knowing your expenses at that time to mm -hmm. expanding to, okay, now we've got this, you know, pretty sizable lease, I'm sure, um, to mm -hmm. purchasing inventory, trying to figure out how much inventory to hold, I'm sure. Um, what was that like for you both? Because you're both entrepreneurs, you're both risk takers in many ways, but the accounting background is more on the side of, you know, erring on the side of being conservative, or at least knowing your numbers to make an educated decision. Tell me about that moment of seeing your first month of expenses and going, oh my goodness, okay, here we go. The shock for me, for sure. Um, and I, it was, yeah. and it's still, even for me being aware of it, um, it's, shock is an understated word with what I it was. I just remind you of a, a PTSD of, of looking at <laughs> <laughs> it. You know, it's actually good. It's healthy right now because it's hard to really make me uh, uh, remember anything like a mindset outside of the, just the current time span that we're in. But no, it was a huge shock with the expenses. Um, and I knew we'd be underwater pretty heavily. I, I had done a cash flow for two years um, and required to do a cash flow uh, for that time frame for the banks. And so I knew from doing all that that we were going to be like, we're not going to see a dime here for a long time. Um, but it was uh, just little things that you have that you don't even think of that can creep up, um, you know, employee overtime. Like, even though you may tell an employee like, hey, you know, life's the same, you know, moving from one bit, you know, we're still greenhouse, we're still this family, but little things like that, all those little expenses can add up. Um, shoot, turning off more lights. Like it's crazy how stringent I became with expenses when I was, found myself just in that moment of injecting personal cash of ours that we had worked so hard for. And Eric looking at me like, is this ever gonna like stop, you know, requiring this and, uh, just trying to generate that growth and maintain and manage the expenses. Um, it's huge. I think they should do more, um, you know, they do first time home buyers courses all the time. They need first time business buyers classes. And yes. I don't think people usually buy the size that we did, you know, but they do. I mean, they, they do, they do. They need first time business buyers classes. <laughs> and maybe that's what I'll do in a few years to start uh, launching that. That's awesome. So for, yeah. so for you guys, you, you looked at the expenses, you did the cash flow analysis for two years for, for the bank. So tell me about the purchasing process. So for someone that might be looking to you know, start a business, and we don't need to dive too much into that, but I want to hear more about your experience. It sounds like you put personal capital into it, maybe went to the bank mm -hmm. um, as well to get additional capital. What is that process like? Tell me about your experience. How did you get capital to keep the business afloat until the profitable months? Uh, yeah, it was a really a process. Um, Eric introduced me, Eric had a relationship already with Shauna at Savvy Bank. Um, and Savvy was uh, incredible, like by far, sorry for the coffee machine. <laughs> oh my God. Um, the, I, ultimately it was like, it was huge what she was able to do in building that relationship with that local bank. Um, I know I could call Shauna right now and she'd pick up the phone if she saw it was me. Um, and I feel confident in that. Um, we, you know, it went to a test. We had kept really good personal financial records up until the point of, um, asking to, uh, you know, purchase a business. So that was a really kind of a key that I found later, just Eric's business is, you know, that's a business of itself and making sure that those records, you know, we had maintained those records well for a few years. And so that, you know, definitely was a huge key factor in showing that we already had a profitable business going into this one. Yeah. So you, you, so basically you're, you're trying to show that you're a good purchaser, a good borrower, right? Mm -hmm. From yeah. that perspective, putting your own capital into it. 
um, making sure that everything was dialed in. And I'm sure that your background in accounting probably helped with that to, to make sure things were in order. But it sounds like when you go to the bank to do that, it's important that you have everything just lined out. They, they can trust that you're going to take this over and do a good job with it. So it's not just, do I have the cash up front? It's, am I a complete borrower? Am I the right person to operate this? Totally. It's showing them that complete portfolio and being ready. It's all those things. I mean, there had been a dozen other people trying to buy a greenhouse throughout the last you know year prior to us getting involved. And they just, you know, for whatever reason, just, just weren't the right buyer. Um, with, with Bree's background, they instantly saw that, that she knew what she was talking about, that, you know, she, she was going to make all the right moves necessary to make it successful. So, yeah. And, and, and Eric, for you, you've been running your own business for, uh, for a long time now with your real estate. Yeah. And, and Bree, you've, you've been operating at a high level within another business. What was that like for you specifically to go from operating at a high level on, in someone else's business to saying, Oh wait, there's the, there's no, the top is we are the top. This is us. And what was that like becoming an on stepping into entrepreneurship from uh, working for a corporate uh, company? Honestly, you know, it felt really good. And truly the way I, the way I, I just held myself in Hagen, I always held myself as if I was at the top. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think all my uh, fellow Hagen, you know, I had so much passion and dedication for that company. Um, you know, not only was my dad, you know, the CFO for so many years, I felt like I could run, like I, I had just been in, I mean, countless meetings. I'd been a part of them for so many years and it was my family. And it, I, it felt like I did own a piece of the puzzle. It, if that, you know, if the store was failing, I, I put all my efforts into it to make sure, you know, to change it, to make it profitable and whatnot. And um, been with them through, you know, the huge acquisition. Uh, I mean, absolutely just out of this world. And and then, it, you know, filing a bankruptcy, I'd been through all that. Um, been with them through selling to a third party, you know, um, investor. I think I had experienced really every level of business that you could possibly experience. And, and I took it also personally. And that's really why I knew I was getting bored and ready for that next step is because I was like, oh, what's left, you know, to, to really help me grow as a person. Um, Cause I felt like I had grown that way. So I don't, to me, it was great. Uh, it was almost like I did both roles for a few months. Yeah. Yeah, it was a few months, did both roles. And to me, it was like, no big deal. Same old, same old. So and in, in you, the, so the, the craziest part to me, okay, so uh, I, I don't have any kids. We don't have any kids yet, but you guys have kids and you guys have your personal life. You want, probably want time together. And you have, the, especially we can talk about the transition, but also now operating. Um, I only have 24 hours in a day and somehow you guys have figured out how to do 36 or 48 hours or how much, however much you cram in. Uh, to each day, but um, tell me a little bit more about what your life was like at that point. How do you, how do you schedule? How do you block that out and then find time to just say, I need personal alone time, or I need, we need time together or time with the kids. How, how did you guys do that during the transition and then after that? During the transition, <laughs> transition, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. I'd say uh, so during this, uh, we'll probably get into this later, I'm sure, but this, during this whole pandemic has been a lot more difficult. Yeah. Um, to try and take any bit of time off. It has been absolutely insane. So. <laughs> and balance has never been, um, I guess the balance is something I've always had to remind myself to do. Um, but to me, like my husband and my kids come before anything and everything. If they call me and need me, or if I feel like they're not doing well, like they will, and my work knows that. And I support my team that way too. If they come to me and say, um, I have one employee who has, you know, a second grader that she's like, oh my gosh, I just missed the Mother's Day tea. I'm like, you go right now, like go and fix that. And I know, you know, I've always said you put your family first and that's the way I lead my team. And that's the way I try to lead our business life. Obviously that has a couple of changes, you know, recently, but um, until then that was something that was very passionate to me and they knew that I will still go and pick my kids up from school. Um, I was blessed when we purchased Greenhouse. Uh, Taylor was in Walker Middle School, which was literally a five minute walk um, and two minute drive. And um, we just found ways to make it work. We did. Yeah, and then maybe it was more like, Eric picked up Jake more, I guess, from elementary school during that time because 
elementary school for us was two minutes from home. You know, middle school was two minutes from greenhouse. So we just we just made it work and had the priorities and yeah. And let everything fall in after that. That's I think that's a trap yeah. that a lot of entrepreneurs fall into. And I've definitely fallen into that trap before where you get you're so excited about what you're building that you forget that everything else should be built around that. Like your your person you should be planning your vacation. Mm-hmm planning your personal time, family time, and then having everything kind of falling around that. And if something falls off the wagon, it's part of it, right? It's totally. it's all part of it. So one of the things I'm really fascinated with, you had mentioned a little bit more about um, looking at their Facebook page and knowing that this was a, you know, a grassroots business that had been here for a long time. But tell me more about the online presence. And you guys have done an amazing job with, with the social media, with the website. The website is beautiful. Um, super easy to use. Um, tell me a little bit more about your vision with that. And how did you grow that? How did that change when you guys stepped in? Because I didn't even know that was there until you guys were there, honestly. Yeah, so I guess uh, going back to that uh, that Thanksgiving day when we're going through all the financials and things, that's where we really saw a big opportunity was, hey, look, you know, they're really not doing too much online business. It's pretty old school. Um, this is a big opportunity to take this to the next level and, and kind of dabble in that, the, the online sales. I mean, and, uh, you know, we, we started off kind of just, uh, rolling with a website that had already been developed and, um, you know, was, was generating a sale here and there. Right. And it was, there's really a lot of marketing that goes into that to generate online sales. I think when we bought it, it was like one sale every eight to 12 weeks <laughs> was it that yeah i'm not oh, yeah. kidding yeah so Where is that now with with online sales um so since then we've we've uh developed our own website it's all brand new systems um and it's all integrated so from our in-store systems to our online systems it all integrates uh, all of our inventory it's very streamlined and and uh now i think i mean since since everyone's kind of sitting at home shopping these days, we're, we're, uh, we brought that up a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been, it's, it's been good. very helpful, um, through the pandemic for sure to have a good system. It kind of started with the process first, I guess, of like building first, I had to build a brick and mortar and build our brand there. And I felt like identify our brand there before I could identify our brand to the rest of the world through an e-commerce site. And when I first jumped into it, I genuinely, when we bought the business, I thought we only needed to change the way that e-commerce worked. And I didn't even know, I'm not going to lie, I'm not good at IT and I've learned, I've had to teach myself a ton because I had no idea the complexity of what an e-commerce site could look like. And therefore also kind of the other side of how simplistic it could be too. So I jumped in, I told, you know, Eric, when we were running the numbers initially to buy the store. We just need to kind of revamp this e-commerce, thinking it'd be easier really than what it was. And by the time I jumped into it like deeper, I realized that no, we need actually to upgrade our entire POS system, which is our front end system. And as well as the e-commerce and uh, did a ton of research on which company to to go um, in with and make a commitment with. Landed on one um, that like Eric said, syncs flawlessly between the e-commerce and the POS, it's virtually the same inventory is being held, so there's no confusion. And um, it took about a year after that then to build it, <laughs> not gonna lie. I thought it'd be again, you know, you look at this thing, you jump into it and you're like, it's gonna be like this really quick process. We're just gonna build this website. And <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, literally I was like, yeah, cool. So like three months and then I was like, okay, our new deadline is gonna be like, six months. And I think we actually did go, we launched the site, started it in July, launched it in first part of February, but really wasn't ready to launch it. Like we launched it, but it was like, we weren't getting any sales on the old site. So it wasn't kind of no harm, no foul, but it took a full year to actually be able to reveal what you see today. And actually we are probably conservatively three weeks away from having an all new, um, even better looking and functioning site than what you see today. Wow. So, it, so what you're saying is that um, I think a lot of people that are becoming entrepreneurs or doing entrepreneurial mm-hmm. endeavors think that these things, especially when you start out, you feel like everything has to happen right now and you're surprised when it doesn't mm-hmm. happen within two to four weeks. And these things take so much time mm-hmm. and planning and, and redoing the systems and then trying them and then them failing or them 
failing a little bit and tweaking this, that, and the other. And so uh, kudos to you guys for that. So th this rebrand um, online presence, that's, I mean, tell me more about the lifestyle vision that you had because, and I'm and, and you're probably glad now during the pandemic that you really worked hard on, on this online presence because mm -hmm. you, part of what I imagine is your demographic would be someone that wants to come in with the quality of a product that you have to come in and like touch it and sit on it and you know whatever these these different uh, uh, pieces of home decor are um, how, how has that changed I mean you guys that's I imagine that's a big part of how you acquire a customer right totally yeah so my vision really when I bought that was believing that yes we needed to build an e-commerce site and, and get that into the numbers that was an opportunity but really was believing in the brick and mortar I believed in the brick and mortar the need for the customer to want to touch, feel, and see things, and just create this like ambiance where they can like, maybe they're having a bad day and they just want to go spend, you know, 30 minutes to an hour getting lost, just, you know, moseying throughout the store and, um, and bringing to them these, these moments almost like the, these miniature moments, like as I walk through that, like are so special to me that I, that I hope is are special to them too. And trying to somehow bring those moments then to life through e-commerce has been incredibly challenging. I think we hit it with this new design that we just did, but I would even say I'm not happy. It's good with what we have now, but I think we can even build on that to truly try to speak to the customer with them not being even present in the store. Um, and that's a challenging thing, for especially sure. Through outlets like social media, um, yeah. because a lot mm -hmm. of people, you know, especially you, you were talking about the millennial demographic, a lot of people, you know, are just scrolling. They're not, they're not going to brick and mortars. It, the millennials are just, you know, I say the millennials, I am one of them. Yeah. Um, so I can't save the millennials. But, <laughs> but I think uh, uh, when we got them, yeah. Yeah. The, the point is though, that, you know, I think that the, the next generation is definitely very much purchasing through or getting really uh, familiar with the brand through Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. probably LinkedIn, other, other platforms. Um, tell me about how have you portrayed that to these different demographics that may or may not be on social media? I think that it's been hard. I mean, for like the social media side, it's like, that's a hard question. Because for me, the social media side has always been just being consistent with our brand and the image that we portray. Um, and I think that that has helped us grow. Uh, you know, to those that aren't on social media, it's tough because you still have to just show them your brand through. Um, I still do direct mailers, which probably to you, you're like, you still send something in the mail. You're, you know, you're probably thinking that's crazy. But to me, there's, I have an audience still that needs that, you know. So that's probably the toughest thing is balancing the trying to continuously engage with the previous audience, try to build a new audience, and then try to also maintain this audience out there that's like not able to visit the brick and mortar because I live in Florida or North Carolina and building them through the brand, through the, the website. Yeah. How, how has that experience been for you guys to go from like say day one where it was, you know, taking over the business that had been established there to, you know, getting a sale from or someone purchasing a, a couch or pots and pans or a butter dish or whatever it may be from across the country. What is that moment like for you as an entrepreneur? Is it like, whoa, this is working? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually kind of fun to see that for sure, you know, to see, wow, how, how are people, you know, finding us? And, you know, we've, we've just recently um, been putting a lot more attention to the, the Google advertising, Google shopping, and, and really pumping that out with, you know, all the behind the scenes keywords and things you gotta you gotta do with that so we've we've got a really good um uh marketing crew that uh we hire full-time just to just to roll on all the google and, and then we have a, a full-time employee all she does is sit there and enter items into our website all day and uh, make sure that that's running smoothly and um, it's very important i mean we've we've invested a lot there's that it. moment though when you wake up on a sunday morning and you see that you just made a couple sales without even being open or paying an employee for that exact moment, like to make the physical sale. There is that like, Ooh, this, okay, this, wait, we might have something here. This could at least supplement, you know, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Th those are, and those are little moments that build up to bigger moments. What, what mm -hmm. are, for, for you as entrepreneurs, what are those, 
do you do you take note of all the little blips that end up be, and then take a step back when you have got a lot of momentum in one arena so you've you've tried something out maybe whatever whether it's the google ads or it's the mailers or whatever it may be as an entrepreneur and you go wait uh that didn't work let's do it again blink okay yeah. oh that works yeah it oh starts getting consistent what is that like for you there are moments that i'll never forget that have defined me and who i am today and absolutely moments in the business that have been the exact same just like you said i remember the first time we launched the new site and it goes live and like with that first sale that happened that night after you know encouraging people on social media uh to to you know purchase from it and this was before you could even link products on instagram man i remember the first time somebody bought a product i'd linked on instagram i was like oh hey we need to make sure more <laughs> items are visible on this you know sales channel here yeah. it worked and um yeah it's been it's there has been so many more as challenging as this last year has been it has been so much more rewarding i just remember so many much more comments from customers little little moments that you wouldn't necessarily maybe remember had it just been a traditional you know standard way of getting there yeah no i, I hear you on that um yeah. and, and so for for retail i'm assuming that there are certain times of the year the seasonality is really important you have consistent sales throughout the year you you know what to expect as a baseline but then probably coming up on the holidays or other parts of the year, how do you guys, I mean, you've been through three holiday seasons. Well, you started on one holiday season. And so mm -hmm. now you're at your third holiday season. Um, how, mm -hmm. Tell me about that experience. How do you ramp up? How do you get prepared? And we can obviously dive into what it's like to prepare during a pandemic, which I'm sure is very different anyways. Yeah. But how have you prepared for, for seasonality uh, within the retail business? So I had been doing that already for a year. So it wasn't anything new to me. Um, like November and December's projected sales, uh, for me, I knew it'd be about double my normal month. Um, it's double one month and about two and a half to three times on another. And um, so I go and I buy for the season in January. So literally like December ends, that's great. You're like celebrating for literally like a day that you just like got through this like super chaotic season and the first second week of January I fly out and I go by holiday for the next year and it literally starts that far in advance of planning and I I start planning there I select the items I select the what I think will be the seasonal trends I select I do way too much analytics on what I think the economy will be like in a year and um, buy for what I feel like the demand will be and sometimes it feels like I'm literally just like taking a dart and trying to throw a blindfold at, um, you know, a board and hope it hits. And then I literally start there with prepping, going back. All the orders will arrive into our warehouse in a standard year at about July, August. So it gives my warehouse team time to price it, organize it, and then it goes out to the store to go up into a display. So you're planning ahead. The, immediately after you finish your previous, let's say, holiday season as a benchmark, you're, yeah. you're like, yay, we're going to pop champagne, pa champagne. The holidays were awesome. Yeah. They were crazy. I don't want to do that again until this time next year. Uh -huh. You're like, all right, it's time to spend some money on ordering inventory. Um, that's that's wild. In the whole mm -hmm. concept of inventory yeah. kind of gives me anxiety. Holding inventory, Ooh. especially like probably pretty high dollar inventory. And mm -hmm. what if some, like, what is that like for you thinking, all right, you, you have to have a confidence, like an air of confidence to say, this is going to sell this, mm -hmm. especially stuff that's, that's outside of what's like the most popular stuff that's selling. You're like, I'm going to try this new thing. You have to have a sense. You both have to have a, a really big sense of confidence to say, all right, this is going to work. We're, we're going to believe this is going to work. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, here's our contingency plan potentially. Right. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> you got to kind of bank, uh, bank a little bit off history, you know, previous yeah. years, how'd it look? Um, how your sales were, things like that. But then you also, you have to plan for the f unknown future of what are the trends gonna be in, you know, 10, 12 months. <laughs> yeah, you know, I would say things change so fast. If, you're, if you don't make a bad buy, you're not a good buyer, right? And buyer being the person who's going out and curating the inventory. So you have to take risks. You can't just give the customer if I give the customer everything they said they liked this year, if I do that again next year, and then again the year after that, and again the year after that, I mean, I'm A, not challenging my consumer. 
yeah. right? I'm not bringing them this moment of innovation and this sense of like, uh, why they want to come back over and over, right? If they know they're going to see the same thing, I'm going to eventually, they're not going to come back, you know, in return. Um, and there's only so much demographic that you can do. Like we all evolve, right? And so I always try to make sure that our products are evolving with us. And the one thing I've said for years, well before I bought Greenhouse, is my job is to expect what the customer wants before they know they want it. And really just putting that item in front of them that they never even thought of. And then they see it and they're like, I have to have this. Whether it's a you know $5,000 couch or a $5 uh, cute little trinket, like that's my goal is to bring them this moment and that realization. And Eric is always incredibly. <laughs> he, it's he, overwhelming for me to say the he least. He has but. stopped coming with me into yeah. the actual buy. It was funny. The first time we went to buy Christmas, especially, and I'd be like, okay, I'll take 36 of that. I want 48 of that. And he'd be like, no. He'd be like, wait, no, stop. How do you know we, we can sell 36 of these? And I'm like, I know we can. Keep going. Like, there's no time. We got to keep going. Are, are you still the main, the the only purchaser, uh, or is are there? Do you have a team that helps you with with some of the purchasing? As, as you guys have scaled, have you scaled that purchasing team? No, it's Bree, <laughs> Sol Bree, wow. solely Bree so far. <laughs> she uh, handpicks uh, every item in there. That is pretty amazing, and I, I I think I would lean in the direction of being pretty overwhelmed by that too. That gives me anxiety. The thought of having to think that far ahead as far as what other people will like when I can't even figure out what kind of, you know, boots I want to buy or tennis shoes or like whatever it is. So that, right. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sleep well tonight thinking about you purchasing. Uh, no, but so but why I do that is I get so excited. Like Leo, have you been in the store yet for Christmas? I haven't been in the season yet. No. Okay. So you have to come in and see what I bought. Like to me, I get super excited to show everybody. Like that is why I do what I do. Like I love bringing happiness to others and having them see like, just wander through and like, I genuinely enjoy it. I do. I, I am amazed by that. And, I, and I'm amazed that you still have time to think about what you want too and what you guys want. So kudos to you guys on that for sure. Um, so this is the cheesiest real estate phrase of all time. Location, 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 right? It's so, but it's so true. It's really dumb, but it's really true. Um, and you guys have this amazing location. It's like right downtown core Bellingham. And obviously it was, it, it's, it's been there for a long time. How, how has that played into the success of the, the retail side, the brick and mortar side? And what would that be like? Would it be different for you if you're say like up in Cordata or over in Barkley? How would that change do you think for the retail side of the business? No, since we, you know, we, we've only been at that location. Um, but yeah, we, you know, Greenhouse has been such a, such a core of the community downtown. And it's, it's been this place where people have just gone for years and years. So um, having that community support just right off the gate, when we purchased the place that was actually going to be closing their doors, we received this overwhelming response from the community right off the bat. And, and having that location, I think is, um, it's definitely helped us, uh, you know, drive that, that core audience that have, have always shopped there, uh, you know, back to, to check our stuff out. And, you know, it's, we've, we've kept a lot of that, that customer base that um, has been there forever. So it's, it's really been helpful, I think. And I think the location really speaks to the brand of the store that we're trying to, you know, tell and the story that we're trying to tell behind the brand. And that's, you know, we're not in Cordata because I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of a lot. There's not that like local niche, larger business there, right? Like in Cordata and there might be, and I apologize if I'm speaking and there is one. Um, I mean, there's a couple of restaurants, I know that, but like from a retail per perspective, and even Barclay, I mean, Barclay has a, probably an open need there, but there again, isn't that like for my scale, the size of greenhouse, I guess, you know, that opportunity to go in there with that size of a place. And to me, downtown's a perfect place because it just has that little bit of a unique vibe. You're going there, maybe not knowing exactly what you're going there for, you know, to look, you're maybe just going there for a day or, you know, just to browse or what have you. And I think that that's exactly what we're, you know, the just community branding that we're trying to build. 
Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, it's it, and and I don't and granted I'm tucked away in the court corner here by the freeway, which is because I'm not in retail. And so it's so interesting for people that are probably watching or people that are starting a business or have businesses um, that want to transition to a different area. That's such an interesting uh, variable to think about with retail that not only do you have to keep the brand going so you didn't have a chance to like start in a new place that was just starting mm -hmm. in the best place, but but it's a whole other nuance to to really look at, which I'm sure comes along with the price tag too. So making <laughs> making sure that 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 continues. Um, one of the things that we had talked about a while back that you guys uh, had brought up was you were talking with these two pretty awesome real estate agents down in Snohomish County about this concept of an HGTV show. And I know anybody that is has heard the word real estate is probably thinking, you know real estate on HGTV. That's what everyone thinks that real estate agents do. But um, how did that come about? How did that opportunity come about? How did it grow? How did it evolve? Tell me more. And you're on season two now, right? Yeah, we are. We just finished up episode um, seven and it's going to be 13 episodes for season two hour long. So um, it was a crazy opportunity. Um, it feels like forever, but uh, when uh, Leslie just reminded me the other day, she's only known me for 15 months, but it truly feels like 15 years in both good and bad ways. I think they'd say the same thing. Um, it was just one of those, they found the store, similarly to how, like if I was in Barclay or Cordata, they probably wouldn't have found me. Um, but they were on a girls trip hanging out in just Fairhaven and downtown Bellingham and wandered into Greenhouse, um, fell in love with the store, and they had just finished their pilot and um, had just been approached by HD for the possibility of a contract for season one. And uh, they fell in love with the store. They called me up and they said, hey, you know, and it was like one of those moments for me, like who gets a phone call saying like, will you come stage all these homes on HGTV for a season? It, it was like one of those surreal moments in life that I probably in the moment totally underplayed and <laughs> probably should have paused and taken it more seriously or whatnot. But um, there again, I remember it was actually Jacob's birthday, our boy. And so I um, spent about an hour talking to him, said, okay, I got to go. I, you know, we were taking Jake to the zoo and the Mariners game that day. And, you know, again, kind of put that on the back burner and had listened to them talk. But I mean, ultimately we connected right away and um, season one kicked off about six weeks after we met and we provided everything you see in those episodes was curated by Greenhouse along with Lindsay and her sister, Leslie. So it's, it's interesting because a lot of businesses, especially in the current age that we're in, the, the digital age that we are in, um, retail obviously is the core, but there's there's all of these different kind of offshoots of how you get visibility, right? And mm -hmm. especially online. And so part of that is, you know, you were doing the staging for Eric and for the for, for the business, the real estate business, but this was like a big scale uh, reach to audience. And this this is probably a big catalyst for you guys to get to find customers and acquire customers from outside of this kind of Whatcom County area. Um, how important is, is audience and visibility on like those moments like that? People, I think a lot of times people don't invest in those because they don't see the return on investment immediately. But how did you look at that and see it as an opportunity to grow the audience? And how important is that? Oh, it's huge. I mean, and I definitely went into it knowing that myself like them you know we're going to invest in season one it's a lot of trust and uh just building growth with the you know other party hoping that for some miracle you might you know get back for season two and so for season one we looked i looked at it i said you know what we can at least break even we can at least gain exposure enough that we'll break even off our investment so i mean it's it's a lot of work i mean what you see is like like on the show, you're not like seeing anything sugarcoated. Like it's a lot of work and we put our heart and soul into it and to deliver what you see. And we, just like I thought, we made our money back. We broke even. We didn't make, you know, we didn't make money, but we made every dime that we'd invested into it at the end of season one. So, and that was exactly what we hoped for. Um, and to me, it was something that I saw that I believe really kept us running through some of these really difficult months of March, April, May, where we were kind of searching for 
how to put that next foothold um, into place. And um, so when season two came up, um, season one was just 10 episodes, 30 minutes long. Season two is now 13 episodes, hour long. So huge opportunity, but then just kind of the investment also goes with it. Upper. And again, I believe that if we can somehow miraculously make it to season three, we might make it, we might make, you know, we, you know, it just, it's a build, it's a long-term, just, it's a long-term wealth building, not, not that short-term, you know, make money quick type of concept, I guess. Hey, hey, if South Park can make it to, to season 30, you guys can do all, I, I, know, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, they never age. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we never, we never grow, we never grow up, right? Um, yeah. So, tell me a little bit more about the show. It's called Unsellable Houses it's on HGTV. Yep. And tell, tell yep. me, explain the concept for people that are not familiar with it. Um, what is the concept of this show that these two uh, agents down, uh, real estate brokers down in uh, Snohomish, came up with and brought you into? What, what's the concept? So that's great because I love the concept. That's actually what kind of sold me on it. Is because it's not what you see on HGTV right now. So Unsellable House is what we do is we take a house that has been listed on the market and has it sold. And believe it or not, that exists. Um, we are still actively, we have four more homes to find this season. We can still find them, like it does exist. So you find this home that has been listed and it isn't selling. Um, they then invest their own money into it to make changes, whether it's like, hey, you know, your kitchen is like tucked away in this corner and it's way too small, or if it's a two bedroom, making it a three bedroom, what have you, they invest their own money into the home to do the renovations. They then split the profits, or I then come in, stage it. They make the renovations, I come in, stage it. We throw it up on the market, it sells, and then they split the profits remainder with the um, seller after recouping their uh, initial investment. And the cool part about all this is most home shows that you watch on HG are all focused on the buyer, right? They're all centered on the buyer and the buyer's purchasing. And this is the only home that I've, like, at that time, at least when they brought this concept to me, where it was focused on the seller and the concept of the selling process, which was really cool to me. So that immediately interested me. And then the other part that I love is that we literally put a different personality and style spin on every home we do. So unlike other TV shows, we're like, um just to, you know, Fixer Upper even does it. I mean, Fixer Upper is an incredible show, but they have kind of that same style over and over again that you see. And what we really try to do is bring a different style into every home. So, um, you know, in season one, we had a, you know, boho chic in a condo that we felt like would be a first time millennial home buyer. Um, you know, we make a modern farmhouse for that, you know, rambler, you know, in a good school district. We put a different home style, different focus on the entire just decor of the home and um our i mean it, it's been proven so far every home has sold uh you know incredibly fast and for well above the original unsellable price well that's an amazing program because and, yeah. you know we don't need to talk too much about real estate but it's one of the things that we're seeing and a lot of people are experiencing is that yes obviously you know homes that are within a certain criteria just disappear within the first you know four to five days but what you're doing is you're, you're stimulating a a wrung out like the homes that are that have a pot like positive attributes to them but for whatever reason just aren't getting the attention or audience that they need and you're actually uh making them more appealing and and and, and uh creating more inventory in my opinion which i think is a, an incredible economic stimulation that we need right and making homes totally. more yeah and they don't talk about it on the show. And it's probably because it was only 30 minutes. I hope they do it more. What we're able to do for these homeowners, I mean, a lot of times it's somebody's first time attempting to buy a home. And you know from being a real estate agent that that first home that you buy, man, that was hard to get into for most people, right? Like that's a huge, that's a huge deal. And then when they go to sell it and they have struggled selling it, that feeling, being able to help them sell their home and make more money off of it than what they would have originally, you know, done. It's a gift. Um, it, it's just, to me, it's so incredible what we're able to do for just individual families and couples um, that need it. You know, a lot of times it's somebody who had to relocate out of state for, you know, some reason. It's not like, it's, it's a great backstory. Um, yeah. And I, I, just, I love helping people. And so that was the other thing that just told me, like, we can serve others and 
and do design and make pretty rooms. Like I'm, I was all in, I was sold right away. Yeah, and how much of, for both of you, um, Eric, I know you have a background in construction too. And so that's a, it's an, an interest. You guys have all these skill sets that you, your tool belt that you, you brought into this. For, for you in the tough months, and I know we can kind of dive into the tough months because there's been a lot of them recently, but um, tell me a little bit more about um, having passion for what you do as an entrepreneur. How, how important is that to push through the tough times versus you know, just feeling like you're going through the motions? How, how is that, how important is that to you guys? Yeah, I mean, I mean, other than this year, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, be, being able to, I guess, be an entrepreneur and, and, and just the real estate for me has been, has been right up my alley. I mean, it's been, it's been amazing. I've learned so much. You, you mentioned the construction and things. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, never really was a general contractor, but I, I did manage a lot of projects and things, um, uh, you know, back in when the, the market was insanely hot back in, you know, 06, 05, 06, 07. And then uh, we ended up going through the largest recession ever. And then obviously there's another learning lesson, you know, you <laughs> going through something like that and having gone through and, and having to, to just deal with everything around that and the economy crashing and all of that, that was a big deal. Um, so surviving that, coming out and then diving into another, you know, continuing to grow as an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, obviously having a partner is, is key. <laughs> yep. um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's everything. It's, it's been awesome. Um, you yeah, know. Passion's huge. It's so important because when you, and there's, you know, and not every day is the same energy level, right? You can't, you can't expect the same energy level every day unless you're no. superhuman and you're just, you know, sleeping. There's new challenges all the time, right? New challenges that, that change outcomes and, you know, just the way you deal with things and uh, yeah, every day is different. <laughs> Definitely. I, I hear you on that. And for, for, you just mentioned uh, how important a partnership is and there's, you know, I've, I've spoken with entrepreneurs that are just doing it on their own. Obviously, they're not fully doing it on their own because they were a team. But how how do you do it as far as being life partners and also business partners? There's, I mean, is there does it does it just seep into both both worlds, or is it is it pretty well kept? Up? How do you guys do it? I mean, we're we're both believe it or not, we're on the same page most of the time. Um, you know, but of course we'll we'll have those uh those powwows where we're button heads a little bit and we've we've got to just slow down and relax and and remember that hey let's you know we're, we are on the same team we don't need to argue about this stuff but um yet yeah, you know another it can definitely be challenging at some points but for the most part we're typically on the same page and we uh we work very well together um we balance each other extremely well what what i'm strong at uh maybe you know Bree's not as much, and yes. what she's strong at, I am definitely not very good at. So, yeah, that was great. Some that yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we have to, it, communication is probably the biggest thing that I can say, and some of it has been learned. You know, on I'll tell you what, it has been through failure that we've learned to do what we do today. But communication, by far, is the biggest thing, and just communicating with each other when maybe, um, you know, he'll look at me and say, "Hey, I need you to be not working." You know in bed right now and um which is every day right now. and i'll be like okay I'll, you know or i'll communicate to him and i'll be like hey i need to be your wife you know for a night and not like your business partner and of course you know it's kind of like your kids you just end up still talking about the business and the kids but it's just communicating and using that balance and um letting the other one know when you're not having a good day or when you're not feeling the best about a decision that you know we've made and um yeah and then also respecting that too. It's it's tough totally. sometimes to be like when one person's in that mode and the other person's not in that mode to say, well, I'm in this mode. Hey, are you not going to join me in this world? And you're like, nope, not happening. Not not today. Yeah, that's tough. You know. Yeah. It can definitely definitely be that way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I have a a big curiosity, and I know that we said no four letter words, and this is not a four letter word, but the word Amazon. Um, <laughs> it's close to I think to yeah a lot. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, to a lot of local business, small businesses, um, I mean, I know that COVID 
was a huge catalyst probably for Amazon to just go like this, right? Because it's so simple to do it. And your products are not sold on Amazon. They're sold on your e-commerce store. How do you, how do you compete with, is that, is that just a different demographic of people or different products? Are you just saying, look, people are going to go to Amazon for this, but they're going to come to us for this. I mean, what is that like for you guys with e-commerce? Well, that's, that's a great question. It's really kind of defined how we, almost our product selection, because about a year ago, we started kind of just refining that. And then through this whole process, we've done the same. I mean, some of our, you know, what even we would consider high-end brands, like um, I'll, I'll give out La Crusade, right? The super, you know, lifetime warranty, gorgeous, you know, cook, cookware and bakeware line is also sold on Amazon. And it's like, okay, if you know that brand and you know what it is, you don't necessarily have to come in and touch and feel it to buy a new piece, right? Like, and that's my kind of how I speak and how I do, you know, our brand on e-commerce even too. And so it's tough, but I found that I, I can always be different. I can always bring these more curated, smaller niche groups. And so it's almost like tr my goal is always trying to take those bigger companies and say, okay, maybe I don't need that anymore. And yeah, there, there may be, you know, a small percentage of my customer base that'll be disappointed if, if we don't continue with this big scale brand, but I know they can also go get that big scale brand at, for the same price on Amazon or Bed Bath & Beyond or what have you. And I need to look for that, um, that brand that is smaller, has more of a niche that isn't willing to sell, you know, those big guys that needs my support and that I can support them. I so that's that. what I just kind of currently, you know, ask myself to do. Um, you know, Amazon isn't a, it's not a long-term solution for anybody who's a small retailer. Um, we could all probably find a way to get on it, but it's one of those things where then you're selling, you know, percentage of your, you know, minimal profits that you have to start with. And, and to me, it's to believing again in that brand and the story that I'm trying to tell and just supporting those that want to be a part of it. Yeah. And, and yeah, I appreciate you being diplomatic because uh, Jeff Bezos watches this a lot, you know, so that's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeff, I appreciate everything you do and what you've created. It's just not what I'm trying to create. There we go. Yeah. Thanks for listening, Jeff. Um, no, but one of the cool parts about Bellingham, um, especially as we've gone through this pandemic, that we've really seen people's true colors throughout this. I mean, we knew that mm -hmm. Bellingham was a shop local, really lean in during tough times uh, mm -hmm. culture here, which is one of the things I love most about it. But that's why I asked that question was I was, I'm so fascinated because Bellingham I've seen turn inwards instead of turn mm -hmm. outwards. I mean, granted there's, there are things you need to go outwards for, but I would say the majority of what people are doing right now is turning inwards and supporting mm -hmm. local, buying local. And it's been amazing to watch. How, how have you guys perceived the Bellingham community during this time, especially let's say, gosh, has it already almost been, when was, when did COVID start? Almost a year ago? March 16th. Yeah. Too yeah, too long. So you want the exact date, yeah. <laughs> at least for me. Yeah. Um, that was actually March 16th was the day that the restaurants had to close. I believe the first time. Yeah. Uh, so shop small Saturday. Um, I was, I, I was in tears feeling so blessed like I there's no words that I can say uh, in terms of a thank you seemed too small um, the community stepped up and they stepped up in a way I didn't even expect them to step up um, and the support was huge um, the support over the last I mean I I debated doing a holiday party because a the word party is not allowed right now and b it didn't um, feel right but it was something that we had done as a company for what 40 over 40 years they'd had this holiday party tradition totally it's a tradition and i didn't even know how to call it other than to be politically correct but i knew with the space that i had that i could do something and that was the other day that i really felt just the love from the community and really um just the support from everybody so i had sent out invitations i sent them out to only bellingham residents with the bellingham mailing address just because in, in Typically, I would send them out to everybody from, gosh, I mean, Anacortes, LaConnor, you know, Camino, all the way up, you know, everybody got an invite to this holiday party, and people who know our traditional party know that, you know, you came and you had, you know, free, you know, appetizers and uh, 
wine or cider and live music and it was this this great night to launch the holidays and to unveil this year's holiday collection and um, this year I felt just that need to still give the community something that was normal um, but I knew I needed to do it in a way that wasn't you know maybe the traditional way to do it so I sent out invites to just Bellingham residents and of course if somebody asked if they could come and they hadn't gotten an invitation I absolutely allowed them to. I uh, gave recommended shopping times based on their last name, hoping that I could then use that to socially distance, limiting the exposure. And again, I did Bellingham because I was like, it just felt okay. Like we all shop in the same grocery store, yeah. right? Like it felt like we were just kind of all controlling maybe the same little, like, I don't know, like there's no control right now, but if we had any, that was it. And I mean, I had the best overwhelming just response. It was so safe. Everybody came, like there was literally a three minute wait in line at most, which normally it was like a 45 to 50 minute wait, but we were able to execute. And I had people that literally told me they hadn't been going out of the house. They hadn't been out of the house since March, but they came to this because they wanted to see, they felt good. Everybody said exactly what they want. They felt like COVID didn't exist, even though they were all wearing masks and, you know, had to stay a snowflake apart from the person in front of them. I just snowflakes, you know, positioned throughout the store. Like it was the safe environment that brought joy, brought happiness. And that's the only thing I can really do right now. I mean, there's a lot that's not, you know, in our control, but I feel like I can continue to be the same brand and image that I've been all along. And that's just, you know, bringing them joy and happiness and the ability to just come in and wander and, and experience uh, the store. Yeah. One of, one of the things that, one of the words that comes to mind when I think of you both is the word grit. And I know that grit has been a lot of people's kind of word or maybe resilience or whatever you want to say. Um, going forward with this, this big vision and this, we'll call it COVID a little blip because it's going to be a little blip and it's going to be gone yeah. and things are going to go back to a new world, but a, but a good world, I think. Um, what does the word grit mean to you guys? I mean, for what you've been through since you started to COVID to your future vision of what, what Greenhouse is going to become, what does that word mean to you guys? What is that? What is that word? Uh, <laughs> a little bit of. Uh, I mean, I speak mainly on this whole COVID thing. I guess it's 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 a little bit uh, just being able to survive, man. Like mm -hmm. you know, trying to adapt to the change that we had and, and adapt quickly to be able to survive was was challenging, um, and that's grit to me. I mean. It, you know, getting into those difficult circumstances that you've maybe never faced before or been a part of, and then just having to, you know, revamp immediately and figure out how you're going to survive. That's great. Yeah, and the confidence in yourself, in your team to do so. Um, I would say grit means that to me too. Like I have confidence in my own, in our work ethic mm -hmm. and my team's work ethic. Um, and I know we can conquer it. Yeah. yeah. We have good people who, you know, want to see us succeed, who, you know, who we surround ourselves with. And um, our, our employees are, they're awesome. They, you know, they love Greenhouse as much as we do. And it shows for sure. You're, you're well, when I think of great. Right? Oh. You're, well, you're talking about betting on yourself and then also finding other people to bet. Like, you can bet on yourself mm -hmm. if you have that confidence to be able to bet on yourself every time yeah. that you know you can get through almost anything, right? Totally. And I know I have the confidence in us to be able to, you know, continue to push things. Like I know that if push comes to shove, um, Eric will be on the other side helping me lift up a couch and deliver it to a customer's house. But having and knowing that I can count on all my other employees to be on the other end of that couch is like, it's this incredible feeling, um, just having that confidence in your team. Absolutely. Well, we're coming into the holiday season or maybe we're, some would say we're already in the holiday season, whatever you, whatever you believe about the holiday season. Um, right. It's all welcome here. Um, so for, for you guys, for people that are looking for uh, amazing gifts, um, you guys are on Instagram, you guys are on Facebook, you guys have your e-commerce website and there's a new one coming out soon. And we'll have all of those links for people to be able to get in touch. I'll make it as easy as possible for people to listen to Building Bellingham to be able to um, get in touch with you guys and ask questions and get more educated on the products. And uh, what, what's the easiest way? What is the best way for you guys right now? If someone's saying, gosh, there's a, there's a huge space in that area. We could use a couch or 
I'm this, this, you know, this, this pot that I've had for fifth, since college, I think I need to get a better pot. Um, mm -hmm. how, how is the best way for people to, oh, well, that's bad English. What is the best way for people to get in contact with you, get the experience so that they, they feel confident, educated with the product, and then ultimately purchase it? Gosh, any way they'd like to connect with us. Uh, they can go to our uh, Instagram handle uh, and reach out to us there, and, and um, they can get in touch even directly with me if they want a design consultation. They can go through Facebook, um, they can email info at greenhousehome.com, or they can just come into the store. Um, we're open six days a week and happy to serve. I mean, really, we are open to serving however they are most comfortable with us serving them. Yeah. So for, for those of you that are watching today, um, all of the links to Instagram, Facebook, the e-commerce, directions to the store, all of those will be in the comments below or in the description below. So feel free to reach out to us if you want to get in contact with Bree and Eric. And uh, to you guys, thank you so much for sharing your story. I know sometimes we get so wrapped up in the everyday grind that we, for, we, we, we sometimes forget our story. Our story is there, but we're like, sometimes it takes some time to un unveil your story and go, wow, we did actually go through all that. So thank you for being vulnerable, yeah. vulnerable and sharing your story uh, what, what you guys have been through to get to this point and create this amazing local brand. Thank Absolutely. You. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And uh, thank you to everyone for watching today. Uh, the, the recording will actually be dropped on YouTube, Spotify, and Google, Stitcher, all the different podcasts, uh, stream platforms that you go to. Thank you all for joining us today. And we are wrapped. <laughs> Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failures, and business with entrepreneurs right here in Bellingham, Washington. You can watch interviews live and be the first to hear about upcoming guests on the Building Bellingham Facebook and Instagram pages. Again, I'm your host, Leo Cohen of the Cohen Group Northwest. This episode was produced and edited by Cooper Hansley and Tiffany Holden. Our logo was designed by Sam Vogt. To learn more about the team behind the podcast, search Cohen Group NW on Google, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn.